Like many carnivores, we have two forward-facing eyes, and that allows us to see depth very well. So we have very good depth perception, the ability to you know, see three-dimensional space and accurately judge distance. And the way we do this isn't just by having two forward-facing eyes. I mean, that helps, but that's just one source of depth information. There's actually tons and tons of different sources. So we call these depth cues. So these are features either in the environment or in yourself that tell you about how far away something is. You have those binocular depth cues I just mentioned. You know, having two forward-facing eyes provides a pretty powerful depth cue. And the way that works is by retinal disparity. So as you can see, you know, all, all animals that have forward-facing eyes have two eyes that are slightly set apart, about an inch or you know, more apart. And by being slightly apart, that means that you're going to get two different two slightly different images to each eye. Now objects that are at different distances will be in different places in the two images you see. And when those two different kinds of pieces of visual information enter the brain and go into the occipital lobe, the result is, is that you get a fusion. So those two separate retinal images are fused into one overall three-dimensional image. There's another binocular depth cue that provides a lot of good information, and that is convergence. That convergence just refers to the degree to which your two eyes must turn inward to focus on an object. So, for example, if I try to focus on this pencil, my eyes, as you can see, my eyes aren't very, you know, crossed. But as the pencil gets closer to my face, my eyes are going to cross more and more, and that's what convergence is all about. And you can feel how crossed your eyes are. And that sensation, that feeling you have, tells you how far away something is. So those are your binocular depth cues. You also have a lot of monocular depth cues, uh, one of which is purely like physiological. It's called accommodation. So accommodation is a depth cue that tells you how far away something is based upon changes in the thickness of the lens of your eye. So your lens, just like your iris, is like it expands and contracts, it gets squished by little muscles, and it does so in order to best focus the light onto your retina. So the harder, the more that, ret that you know, lens needs to be squished or whatever, the closer the object appear will f seem to be. But uh, there is a whole long list of uh, depth cues that you can see in what we normally call two-dimensional pictures. So like a painting, for example, or a photograph. These are full of depth cues. So it's kind of erroneous to say that it's a 2D picture. I mean, yeah, it's flat, but it's packed full of information about depth. One of the most classic pictorial depth cues is linear perspective. If you've ever taken an art class, you know all about linear perspective. It's just based on the apparent convergence of parallel lines in the environment. Now, the closer uh, an object is to the horizon line in such a linear perspective, you know, drawing, the closer it is to the horizon line, the larger it will appear to be. Or if the size doesn't change, the farther away or closer it will appear to be. Here's an example. So here you have a basic horizon line, and you can see if I put the object right here, it doesn't look too far away. It kind of looks like it's right up next to you. But by simply moving that object closer to the horizon, you can see that it actually looks like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that's because since the size hasn't changed, that means that it must be growing. If something moves away from you but it doesn't change its visual size, then it must be getting larger and larger as it moves away. And this explains the moon illusion. So the moon illusion just refers to the fact that where the moon is in the sky, will make it seem bigger or smaller. In reality, that moon is always the same size and it's always the same distance. So the only thing that makes you perceive it as being larger or smaller is just how close it is to that horizon line. Remember, the closer it is to the horizon line, the further away your brain thinks it should be. But if it hasn't actually you know, moved away from you, and if it doesn't visually change its size, 
then that must mean it's growing. So the consequence is that when you look at the moon right on the horizon, it looks huge. But when you look at it directly above, it looks tiny. But if you measure it, if you like get out a ruler and you literally measure it at both locations, you'll see that it is exactly the same. Other pictorial depth cues would be things like light and shadow, so just how something is shaded. You can see these objects that I just created in PowerPoint. If I use a basic shading effect, it makes them really look like they're kind of popping out at you. So depending on how objects are shaded, it can give them a three-dimensional appearance. Another pictorial depth cue is texture. So objects that are closer to you tend to appear more textured. They, they look more detailed than objects that are farther away. So the farther away something is, the smoother it tends to appear. Overlap, uh, here's another example. With overlap, when one object blocks another one, that object that's blocking will appear to be closer. So in this illustration you see here, the red box would appear to look the closest, whereas the green one must be the furthest away. Uh, another pictorial depth cue is aerial perspective. So just uh, how hazy, how blurry objects appear in the distance will make them seem further away. Another one is relative motion or motion parallax. This, is, this refers to the fact that nearby objects move a lot as your head moves, but objects that are further away don't. So if you ever like do something like this, like let's say you're at a museum and you're checking out some sculpture and you're doing this, that just, that's just a way for you to get additional depth information. That's actually a very effective way because you know objects that are further away will move more than objects that are close up. So I also wanted to talk briefly about motion detection. Our brains are very good, along with most animals, at detecting motion. Motion is one of the most interesting kinds of things that you can perceive. Uh, how many times have you been, you know, just walking along and you see something move and it catches your attention and you have to know what that was? Or like if, if you're surfing the web and some animated little advertisement starts playing, that will grab your attention. Or if the entire time I've been talking you've just been staring at that little dot that's flying all over the place, that's another example. So clearly paying attention to motion putting so much interest in motion has some clear survival value. I mean, you want to be able to detect that, you know, lion that's about to jump out of the bushes and eat you before it does so. But the interesting thing about motion is we are so interested in motion, our brains are so well suited to detecting motion that we will sometimes detect it even when it doesn't exist. The most classic example of this would be the phi phenomenon or what's also called stroboscopic motion. So the sequential flashing of stationary lights gives, will give the perception of light as appearing to move. So an object, you can make an object appear to move by simply flashing lights in sequence. And this is how all movies and all television and all, all animation works. It's just when you watch these things, the things you think are moving aren't. It's just the sequential flashing of patterns of light. So here's an example of the phi phenomenon. As you can see, the you, if you look at this, it start, it'll look like something is moving. In reality, we just have lights flashing on and off in sequence. 